Hi, my name is Sophie. I'm a second year PhD student at the Department of Politics and International Studies at the University of Cambridge. And today I wanna to talk about an argument for focusing on representation and our representatives in order to create caring democracies. I wanna do this by first uh, talking more generally about care ethics and the political, then focusing in on care ethics as it relates to democratic theory and democratic processes. And I wanna show that there's a gap in this work, which is a, a neglect for the concept of representation. There's no thinking about how the concept of representation and how our representatives may be playing a role in the creation of, uh, it may, be, may potentially, sorry, play roles in the creations of creation of caring democracies. The, this gap is a considerably important one if care ethics is to continue to develop into a full political theory. And I wanna draw out two particular developments in work on representation and de in debates about representation that show why this gap is really important to fill. To start then, care ethics in the political is, is quite an expansive field of work. There is a lot of research that investigates the different ways in which care ethics may be relatable to politics or politics may be relatable to care ethics. And I borrow, I borrow here from Sten Sota who splits it into kind of two separate inquiries. One, on the one hand, we have work that looks into kind of favorable, and this is her wording, favorable circumstances of particular treatment and flexible care for individuals. So this is very much grounded in work on that dyadic care relationship. So the one-on-one -on -one relationships of care that we engage in uh, on care work and the physical practice of caregiving. So this often relates to work for vul on vulnerable, vulnerable groups, sorry, uh, like those in aged care, child care, foster care, nursing, and kind of how we can improve these uh, typical or traditional structures of care uh, using insights from an ethics of care work. The second separate um, type of inquiry that Sten Soter highlights is an exploration more generally, which moves into the wider public realm where institutions and policies serve to establish and promote the conditions under which caring for can flourish. She gives the example of, of research on citizenship and social policy, but there are a number of examples of where this exploration more generally has taken place. So for example, Sten Soto herself has developed a public ethics of care, um, and Peter Urban has looked into kind of caring organizations uh, and how an ethics of care insights are really relevant on a larger scale and not just for that one-on-one -on -one relationship uh, that is happening at an individual level. These, these, uh, this work, sorry, is, is also often based on a much broader definition of care. And I've put it here, Fisher and Tronto's definition uh, of care being a species activity that includes everything we do to maintain, continue and repair our world so that we may live in it as well as possible. Critics often see this uh, expansive definition of care as, as a potential weakness, but care ethicists themselves believe this is quite a considerable strength. And I would like to side on, on that side of it being a strength and, and, and argue that the language of care has a lot of potential, particularly for representation, which is what I'll get to in a moment. Before that, I just want to talk briefly about some of the key debates that are happening with regards to an ethics of care and democracy. I've grouped it into, a, into four categories here. Uh, one area of work focuses particularly on exclusion from democratic processes. So this talks about how people who are involved in caregiving, but also the vulnerable groups, vulnerable groups such uh, like those I mentioned uh, previously, are often excluded from democratic processes. Their voices aren't reflected uh, and therefore they don't get the priority that they deserve on, on kind of political agendas. The silencing or the suppression of these voices uh, happens kind of across different democracies and the way in which we need to correct for this in order to strengthen the caring nature of a democracy is, is something that a lot of authors look into. Another area of research looks into how more generally uh, citizens seem to have become unconcerned with participation, with truth, with listening, with attentive listening, um, and that this constitutes a kind of lack of care and a lack of attentiveness in public and democratic life more generally. Another area is look at, looks specifically at the welfare state and the way in which insights from an ethics of care work can inform policies uh, within welfare states and can improve the way our welfare states operate. So, Engster, for example, 
has a brilliant array of of policies developed using this these kind of uh, insights. And lastly, I've put there, although this is kind of a, a theme that can come up uh, come up across a different a variety of different work, is this idea of democratizing caregiving and structures of care themselves. So, for example, where we talk about improving democracies uh, to be more caring, we also need to talk about democratizing care itself. And Tronto particularly talks about this and uses the language of, of deficits. So she says that we have a uh, care deficit in democracy and a democratic deficit in uh, care, and that both of these need to be addressed. So these are kind of some of the really important ways in which care ethics has been used within democratic theory and to link care ethics to democratic processes. But what's missing? is uh, thinking about the processes and the practices of representation, uh, the concept of representation and the role of our representatives in democracy. What comes across as a, as a key thread across all of this work is the importance of widespread and inclusive participation. And now I don't doubt the importance of it. It neglects the relevance of representation uh, I want to just quote here from Tronto. She says that to reimagine, we reimagine democratic life as ongoing practices and institutions in which all citizens are engage, engaged. And this engagement presumes that relational selves who need ongoing participation, ongoing participation as both receivers and givers of care. So this theme of participation is, is really strong. And of course, it's important to, to uh, create widespread and inclusive participation when talking about those who've been who have been previously excluded from such participation. At the same time, however, uh, representation and thinking around representation is missing, and this is a problem. The reason why this gap is so important to fill um, is because there have been some recent developments in representation literature. Two of these developments, I think, are really important to thinking, not just filling the gap, that's missing, but in thinking through how representation and care ethics might relate. So the first comes in a challenging of the assumed opposition between participation and representation. Many authors have, have looked into how participation and represent, representation are actually intimately connected and in seemingly uh, strong mechanisms of participation, representation and representatives still play a very important role. One example that I draw on here, which is the South African one, and it's the case that I'm investigating, uh, is a mechanism called ward committees, which was introduced in order to move towards this idea of a more participatory democracy, and it was labeled as such. But evidence suggests that the functioning and the success of these ward committees depend on the representatives themselves and how uh, the, and the translation of, of people's realities into and onto the political agenda depend on how they are represented and, and the representatives that are doing the work. The second really important um, development is in, exploring, is in exploring an alternative understanding of representation. So the traditional understanding of representation, which draws heavily on Hannah Pitkin's uh, famous and celebrated work, talks about representation as something that is a state of affairs that can be achieved. Uh, via an election. This kind of produces relationships that are labeled as principal agent relationships or mandate relationships. And it's, it's a very fixed uni-dimensional uh, approach to representation. Some authors who have been labeled as kind of constructivist and labeled it as a constructivist turn have argued that this is an incorrect understanding of what's actually taking place uh, during representation. So they argue that what is happening is that representation, uh, representatives sorry, are engaged in a much more constant and ongoing claims making process, both formal and informal representatives. And they are a key part, the representatives, in not just the expressing of citizens' preferences, but in the creation. They are key um, actors within this kind of translation of people's realities onto the political agenda. Uh, what, what's, what really stands out in, in this kind of exploration of an alternative concept of representation is a stress on dynamic and ongoing relationships. And this is really important as we relate why this focus on representation is so important. 
as I mentioned, that kind of participation and representation change and the change to seeing them as more interconnected is, is a really important part of why it's why it would be insightful or why it would be necessary, sorry, to gain some insights from uh, using representation in care ethics and care ethics and representation. And here I mentioned that changing our assumptions of how people participate and the best way to translate realities onto the political agenda is by embracing this more nuanced understanding of participation and representation. And I think that would fill that gap really well. And then the second, is that idea of relationships with representatives. Combining the insights from this representative uh, or this constructivist turn, sorry, in representation literature and an ethics of care's understanding and framing of relationships, I believe goes a, a long way in developing a more caring democracy and, and in a very real and practical way. So I wanna touch very briefly on just some concluding thoughts on why filling this gap and theorizing about representation as it relates to care ethics is really important. So as I've outlined in democratic theory and care ethics, there's this missing uh, part, which is a thinking about relational, uh, which is a thinking about representation. But the reason why it would be very important to fill this gap is the promise uh, that the language of care provides. I think using the language of care encapsulates a lot of the considerations that we need to have when it comes to improving how we relate to our representatives, how representative mechanisms are put in place, how representation at both the local and a more national level takes place. And I think the language of care has a lot to say on understanding those re relationships and potentially creating better relationships and structures that can facilitate better relationships. The second point, and it's something I haven't mentioned, but it's a really interesting connection between this constructivist turn in representation in representation literature and care ethics is this focus on power. Tranto has said that care ethics is essentially about relational power and uh, this, uh, this more ongoing and dynamic process of representation that comes from this constructivist literature allows us to have an increasingly uh, nuanced and informed understanding of the different power relations at play in democratic politics. Thirdly, as I, I mentioned just a moment ago, it could potentially lead to some real and practical changes some very implementable ways in which we can create structures that facilitate the development of caring relationships between representatives and the represented. And lastly, and I've mentioned this quite a few times, it just informs a better way of understanding how we currently translate our realities into politics. And I think unless we have an understanding of the role that representatives play in this, in this process, I think it uh, will be lacking that key um, agent in that process that's taking place. So just to summarize, um, Care Ethics hasn't really thought through representation and representatives and how they might be key players in this creation of a caring democracy. And I think it's a gap that needs to be filled. And I think it's a really important time to fill that gap because of this constructivist turn in representation literature. Um, and yes, I look forward to any questions and thank you for listening. Hello everyone, my name is Sarah Howard and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Birmingham. The paper I'm going to present today is based on around 16 months of ethnographic research with low-level government workers in North Shore, a rural lowland area of our region. And where the star is marked there. Um, I'm going to be exploring in this paper how breastfeeding has come to be the subject of correction and management by the Ethiopian state and its global counterparts, despite its almost universal practice. Anthropologists have long explored how breast milk can sustain and mediate kin relations. Here I will suggest that breast milk can be seen as a political substance, central to a long class-based and racialized history of public health attempts to mark maternal practices in Africa and across the world. I'll begin with a description of a meeting I attended that took place in a village health post. I was about breastfeeding and nutrition for young children and nursing or pregnant women. 
It was organised by an international NGO with a head office in the UK and run by a man who previously had been a government employee. With a paternalistic manner and dressed in the palette of grey, beige and muted green, favoured by the professional classes. De Baba, not his real name, was well versed in the modalities of such meetings known as tradings or siltana in Amharic, the base verb of which can also be translated as to civilise. As on this occasion, they involved an outside expert, invariably male, lecturing groups of local people about what they should be doing to improve their lives while they listened without asking questions. Standing in front of many breastfeeding women, Dababa urged them to feed their children porridge and not sweets. You can also add many things to porridge to make it more nutritious, he went on, giving the examples of tomatoes, eggs and cabbage. There were a handful of eagerly attentive women sitting at the front, but from my position at the back, I could see that most of the women were unimpressed, were unimpressed and overhear comments such as, you don't put tomatoes in porridge, what a joke. One woman fished a dirty lollipop out of her pocket for her toddler while Dibaba was exhorting them not to feed children sugar in what was either unthinking coincidence or deliberate defiance. When he advised a pregnant woman to eat healthy food such as papaya and avocado, neither of which were grown locally or sold at the market, she openly scorned his suggestion. It was clear during the training that a large part of its rationale for intervening to correct the way women practice breastfeeding or ate while pregnant was based on disapproval of so-called harmful traditional practices. In North Shoa, these apparently included rejecting the early milk called colostrum and the belief that pregnant women should not eat bananas, milk or porridge in the last trimester. I say apparently because this was only reported to me by health officials, not by local women themselves. However, the training did not mention the many norms, values and practices that support the practice of long-term breastfeeding. These included the exemption of breast milk from religious precepts about the polluting nature of bodily fluids in Ethiopian Orthodox Christianity, the majority religion in North Shoa. Crucial to her intercessory role, Mariam is a figure of purity and containment who is said not to have menstruated. However, she did breastfeed. Norms about bodily exposure are also suspended. Marking an absolute distinction between the erotic body and the maternal body, while the period of araspate or seclusion of postpartum women during which time they do not leave the compound, do any or do any housework and are fed rich food, is also an opportunity for mothers to firmly establish a pattern of on-demand breastfeeding. In her work on attachment mothers, who practice long-term breastfeeding in the UK and France, anthropologist Charlotte Faircloth looked at breastfeeding as a way of not only producing relatedness, but as identity work for mothers who were self-consciously engaged in constructing a breastfeeding self. Mothers in North Shoa and across Ethiopia also have a strong sense of maternal identity, and providing breast milk for their children is an important part of their loving and caring role, one which is normalised and naturalised as unremarkable and unproblematic. Health professionals in the nearest hospital told me that inability to breastfeed is unknown or even unthinkable. Sorry, I think I missed a bit. Health professionals in the nearest hospital told me that inability to breastfeed through lack of milk is extremely rare, while lack of desire to breastfeed is unknown or even unthinkable. Young children accompany their mothers at all times and, off and are offered the breast often and always at the first sign of discomfort or distress. Mothers also respect their child's need to suckle as a form of comfort as well as a source of food. Crying babies are not part of the soundscape of rural North Shoa. These norms, combined with the fact that women's work took place in and around the home, were all supportive of the near universality of long-term breastfeeding in rural North Shoa. As such, of all the potential issues that may attract attention and resources in the name of development, notably in a rural area with no clean water supply, all-weather road or electricity, Infant feeding is not an obvious choice. In fact, in a large scale survey of the incidence of continued breastfeeding at 12 months conducted by the Lancet, Ethiopia is in the all African top five of the global league table, while the UK is at the very bottom at just half of 1%. Nevertheless, interventions into breastfeeding and child nutrition take place at a variety of scales under the auspices of international NGOs as well as being central to one of the state's most lauded initiatives, the Health Extension Programme. Although state and non-state cannot usefully be disentangled here, 
For example, as part of a collaboration with a British NGO during my PhD, I was asked to produce a report to feed into a bid for funds to promote correct forms of breastfeeding on Ethiopian state-run media channels. The fact that there were funds available for such activities in a country that has exceptionally poor rates of breastfeeding targeted at a country where the vast majority of women continue to feed for at least a year and often much longer. is indicative of the global inequalities that structure development planning and practice. To some extent, the infant feeding choices of most mothers around the world are the object of scrutiny and moralised attention. However, as historian of public health Randall Packard writes, colonial era narratives about the need to correct and reform the feeding practices of women in the global south have persisted into the post-colonial era of global public health, in part premised on a logic that sees culture and tradition as barriers to progress and modernity. If breastfeeding is globally acknowledged to be a public health good, it's Ethiopian mothers who should be advising the population of the UK on their achievements in long-term breastfeeding. The fact that this is a laughable idea, not least because they would never be granted visas to enter the country, shows the enduring strength of global hierarchies of knowledge and value. Global standards on infant nutrition, codified by the World Health Organization and minimally adapted by the Ethiopian government, place the emphasis on women and families to alter their behavior and adopt nutritional practices that will form healthy and modern citizens. As in Dibaba's advice above to a pregnant woman to eat healthy fruits that are unavailable to her, nutritional and breastfeeding guidance follows a pattern in which questions of poverty and access are neglected in favour of an idealised and individualised behavioural change that it falls upon women to enact. In this paradigm, the main barriers to optimum infant feeding lie with tradition, leading to erroneous superstition and lack of education, also often attributed to traditional ideas about the education of girls, both of which can be overcome by individual mothers if they receive information and training. Shifting the focus away from the structural issues that impact on the health of children and their mothers in this rural area, foremost among them the poorly equipped health post, dirty water and lack of transport, breastfeeding becomes the subject of moral injunctions for self-improvement. In his analysis of the potential of a distributive politics, James Ferguson characterises suckling as the primal human act, as an illustration of how unconditional care proceeds, or should proceed, productive capacity. While suckling may be primal, the practice of breastfeeding certainly is not. Far from a straightforward natural process unaffected by the wider cultural or social world of the mother and child, it plays an important role informing individual and collective maternal identities and anthropologists have long recognized the ways in which breast milk creates and sustains relationships relatedness at a variety of scales not limited to the biologically related diet of mother and child in islamic jurisprudence milk kinship creates relations between those who have consumed and supplied breast milk that are analogous to blood relations while across Africa, scholars have shown how breastfeeding can be a means of assimilation of ethnic others. Breast milk has also long crossed social boundaries in a variety of commercial, exploitative and altruistic arrangements from working class and enslaved women whose bodies were used as technologies for richer families, as historian Joan Sherwood writes, to contemporary practices of milk sharing and milk banking. It's now considered a pillar of global health but the massive variation in breastfeeding advice over the centuries, including for many years, the discouraging of breastfeeding altogether, clearly shows that there is no biological bedrock against which to standardise or stabilise feeding practices. Despite its unremarked upon and almost universal long-term practice, we've seen how breastfeeding and infant nutrition in Ethiopia is a site for management and correction for the state and its international counterparts, part of a long history of the global governance of maternity. Educating African mothers in the proper management and care of their children has a long history as a tool of reform by colonial powers and in Ethiopia by Haile Selassie's modernising imperial government. As I've shown, interventions into breastfeeding are characterised by a designation of infant feeding practices as affected by harmful tradition, while ignoring structural and economic factors, as well as the norms and customs that support breastfeeding. The disinterested gift of breast milk unconditional and unearned, as Ferguson describes it, 
has harnessed to developmental narratives in which substandard child nutrition is responsible for, according to an Ethiopian government policy document, suboptimal productivity in adults and reduced economic growth for the nation. These attempts to bring a fundamental and intimate act of care into the domain of the public and instrumental shows how attention to the governance of care is a productive way of destabilizing public private distinctions and how the intimate and effective is crucial to the constitution of the public sphere. Thank you for listening. And I look forward to the discussion. <laughs>